hazard assessments. Uh, for larger airports, it's 75% up to 95%, and sometimes uh, they're getting 95% of these things paid. So again, there's federal money available for this. And I can tell you, some of the airports absolutely re re uh, resist and actually um, uh, resent the fact that they're being forced to do this. Um, because they think that that money could be spent on other projects. But it, it, it cannot. It's earmarked for hazard assessments. So, you know, if I'm an airport out there and the FAA is offering this funding, take it, right? Get this done. Again, because that's why you require it. As we don't do it now, it's possible to make one for approval. It's, again, it's not, um, you know, they're not there. I should tell you that we go usually 99, 100% with whatever's recommended in the yeah. assessment because we're not the experts. Yeah. And, sure. and again, if they have a question about it, their recourse is, uh, well, hope we're, we're actually trying to get a lot of the certain inspectors trained on this as well, because they're ultimately the ones that are enforcing compliance uh, once these go into the ACMs. But uh, his recourse is, if he's got a question about a recommendation, he, he brings it to Washington, D.C., to one of the staff wildlife biologists to comment on a particular recommendation, whether that's appropriate. And if, if so, then you'll monitor that in, in the uh, actual implemented management plan. Uh, but you know, the, he, he does have another step. Or, again, frequently the... Usually the, not that extreme, the recommendations. Yeah, just right. This, this, and, this, yeah, so pretty straightforward stuff. Or they'll sure. go to USDA. Like I said, USDA is a resource uh, for the MOUs that I showed you at the beginning here. Uh, you know, to say, hey, I don't understand the biology of this, and I'm not picking on you when I say that, but uh, you know, I need some help. So they'll go to the local state director, for example, and say, is this a reasonable way? So, and if, for example, if you live in Las Vegas or if you're in Tucson, you can't grow grass on those airfields. So because there are places like Las Vegas and Tucson that can't grow grass, the FAA will not mandate this requirement because they can't enforce it. Air Force, by contrast, if you live in, in, you know, if you're at Dallas Air Force Base in Las Vegas or Tucson, the Air National Guard unit or the active duty unit there, uh, if you can't comply, you get a waiver. So the reason that's so significant is because the FAA only has a recommendation out there, then the airports think, well, it's only a recommendation. I can do whatever I darn well please. And so this has caused all kinds of confusion. Um, there are a number of papers that are published out uh, across the globe on this very topic. And um, I can summarize these things for you in a minute here, but also give you the biology behind it. The problem with these papers is that they're generally species specific or they're targeted to a particular species. So if you have gulls, you grow grass in this range and it works. If you have grackles, you do this. If you have morning doves, you do this. If you have blackbirds, you do this. If you have rodents, you do this. Uh, and an airport goes, I got all of those. So what do I do? <clears throat> and this is the compromise that works across the board. The objective for the airport, course, of course, yeah. is to make a yeah. little patch of, uh, you know, basically a black hole where we're not going to attract wildlife to that area. Leave us what, out of the conversation. Yeah, what goes on <laughs> outside of the airport, um, the airport nor the FAA have any regulatory authority over. Now, the FA will make recommendations to the other agencies, and the MOU that we talked about yesterday as well uh, goes right to that. Uh, and typically, the other agencies follow the FA's recommendation because they're the aviation experts. But they, again, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the EPA, uh, other regulatory agencies actually have regulatory control over those uh, entities, whether they choose to on, work with them. Wildlife population really management. And so, your plan doesn't include methods of managing the wildlife populations. I think, and there was a serious incident on the airport, uh, there could be some questions brought up as to why, uh, why didn't you have a permit to depredate uh, or take uh, wildlife that were uh, obviously identified as a threat in the, in the uh, in the uh, wildlife hazard assessment, and so on and so forth. So keep that in mind. That's a part of the uh, regulation. Next, next slide. Uh, adjusting flight schedules. Now, you know, Captain Eschenfelder has talked about that quite a bit, and I just want to make a note that there are things that can be done depending on the airport. 
This is Burke Lakefront Airport where we've had fatalities. Uh, it's a Part 139 certificated airport, uh, but very minimal uh, commercial traffic. Uh, a lot of uh, <coughs> charter uh, planes come in there. And they have a sign when the pilot walks out of the room out onto the field to get on his airplane, there's a sign that says, please report all wildlife ha hazards prior to departure. And so if you see birds on the airport, and they do often have galls there, don't take off these brands, brands but these uh, uh, pyrotechnics, as Dr. Fusco mentioned, uh, it's a very versatile tool. And one of the great things about pyrotechnics is you've got a human being out there with it. And so the birds associating that noise and firing with the vehicle and with the person, and, uh, and you can direct your power techniques exactly where they need to be. And of course, in a situation like this, the first thing you should be getting rid of that, that wet one here. And you wouldn't have to be dispersing <coughs> out of Next uh, slide. Okay, this is something, um, it gets back to the auditory repellents. Um, and, and again, the power techniques are you know, half visual, half auditory, because you've got a flash of light uh, or smoke with them as well. <coughs> The stress calls are an area I think a lot of work could still be done in. I remember back in the 70s when I first got in this business, there was a lot of interest in distress calls, and people were using them with starlings around feedlots and uh, for loose dispersal, and, and the, the whole science of loose capability of flying, or not very limited capability of flying. This coincides with the young geese that were hatched in May are growing their flight feathers for the first time. And so you sort of synchronize in the adult geese, grow their flight feathers, the new flight feathers, and the young geese get their first flight feathers at the same time. And by mid-July, they're all up and flying again. LaGuardia Airport is a very compact airport. Right next to it is Rikers Island. And Rikers Island is the city prison for New York. It's owned and operated by the city of New York, their prison uh, or, uh, division. And uh, it is the home, or has been in the past, historically, to a significant number of Canada geese that gather here during the mold period and uh, feed on grass around uh, Rikers Island and, uh, and go, go through the mold and then um, disperse back out around the area, and they often end up over on the airport, feeding on the grass on the side of the airport, or flying over the airport. And uh, this was a problem which was uh, pretty much ignored by the city uh, with the exception of some limited egg oiling that was going on, uh, on to prevent geese from nesting on Rikers Island, but nothing being done to prevent the birds by uh, gun and other mammals, if appropriate, other uh, animals. And, you, and, and having said that, you have to have absolutely properly trained people who know what they're doing uh, to do it. But uh, you just never know what situations are going to come up where you may need to remove uh, certain animals. Next slide. And uh, the key things are trained personnel, appropriate gun and ammunition, permits in place, and you know, your a lot of communication with local law enforcement uh, where everybody's aware of what's going on. Next uh, slide. Um, generally, you know, a large caliber or larger caliber uh, rifle for deer, uh, very specialized air rifle for pigeons, and a 12-gauge shotgun for gulls or waterfowl. Uh, I think Russ was saying, I think in, uh, in San Juan they used a 410 shotgun, so with, uh, you know, a much smaller shotgun. With Lines, but typically the 12 gauge shotgun for gulls and, and waterfowl. The air rifle for pigeons is, you know, these modern air rifles are quite accurate and uh, with the telescop, uh, telescopic sights, uh, they can be uh, very effective in removing pigeons from hangars and uh, other uh, buildings. By sites some of the low lying areas. areas, we are going to have some of those marshy areas. We've got that much acreage, the water goes somewhere. Uh, grasslands, forest layer, or woodlands type situations. Of the 55% that is developed, it is comprised of an AOA, Airport Operations Area, 
seven active runways, and I think this is about 15, give or take, miles of active runway space. Five passenger terminal buildings, and if you're unfamiliar with the area, it's kind of like a spine with the terminals located on either side of International Parkway. Terminal A, B, C, D, E, and this is a parking space in our GA uh, facility is also located at the south end of the airport. How, we're addressing it, how can asset management help us out? How do we need to uh, manage our grasslands? How do we keep the shrubs and the vines and everything from growing on the fence? So all of that information is communicated and we do this essentially by not only meeting the minimum eight hours training that the FAA requires, but also exceeding it. Um, we've got periodic um, uh, procedures that we communicate, and I'll go over some of them in a second. This is what happens when that meets aircraft. This was donated to us by Pratt & Whitney. That particular bird didn't do it, <coughs> that type of bird did. This is one of a number of fan blades that was damaged by one individual pigeon. And when I can give this fan blade to um, a contractor, and I can give it to a taxi driver and say, this is what happens, and this costs how much? How much does this cost? Yeah, that's one. So we have these here at the airport. It does occur. Damage does occur. And whatever we can do to minimize the damage is extremely important. Now, you also are going to run into some interesting <coughs> situations when you're talking to people. I had one gentleman tell me, but if I don't feed the birds, um, his higher up was, would be unhappy with him. Well, Try thinking about it not in that way, but that you're, if you do feed the birds, you're bringing them to an unsafe place. It's like bringing them into the lion's den. This, this bird, the, one, the bird that this 